Greetings everyone, my name is Pavel Sterma and today we'll discuss the top news of this day. Starting with the upcoming winter season of Ukraine and threats that emerge with it. Winter is coming. German Foreign Minister arrives to Ukraine for the eighth time during full-scale war. Her main message is Germany is supporting Ukraine with humanity in this cruel time of inhuman war and promises $180 million in aid to the energy grid of Ukraine before winter. Many analysts say that this winter will be the hardest in the history of Ukraine and there's danger of nuclear power plants being targeted by Russian strikes. Ukraine has a short-term plan to survive this winter, but to assure energy security in the coming winters, we need to decentralize the energy system. Shortages and shutdowns are inevitable. The question is whether they will be large or little, and this depends on how well the power plants are safeguarded. Air defense is vital, and decentralization must be achieved concurrently. Maxim Timchenko, CEO of Ukraine's energy generation company DTEK, in a comment to Financial Times. Back at the UN General Assembly meeting, Derensky said that Russia destroyed all Ukraine's thermal power plants and damaged all hydroelectric plants in a way to torment Ukrainians ahead of winter. And the risk of nuclear plants being targeted this winter is 100%, Ukrainian president said back then. Russians are planning to damage and hit the infrastructure of NPPs, which accommodate for 60% of all generation in Ukraine, to bring Ukraine into complete darkness and cold this winter. The answer to this – stop Russia from the possibility to produce missiles, drones, and provide Ukraine with air shield to withstand the onslaught. Energy must stop being used as a weapon. Throughout 2024, Ukraine has faced a challenging situation in its defense in the front line, particularly in Donetsk Oblast, where Russia has consistently concentrated its forces and pushed for attack. After a meeting with a delegation of the Czech Armed Forces, Commander-in-Chief Sirsky described the situation on the battlefield as difficult and added that Ukraine is facing one of Russia's most powerful offensives since the start of war. Russian armed forces are advancing using the strategy of rolling advance when waves of infantry storm Ukrainian positions without end and days of glide bomb strikes and artillery bombardment with North Korean shells and harvesters. Ukrainian infantry simply has to leave ruins of positions and settlements they once defended and fall back to fight enemy waves again. And while North Koreans come to fight against Ukraine, the public reaction from Western allies remains stable. And President Zelensky is frank about it. If nothing happens, and I believe that the reaction that is there today is nothing, it is zero, then the number of Korean soldiers will be increased on our soil. Apart from that, we know that there is an agreement in the making to transfer engineering troops as well as civilians. Huge number of civilians from North Korea to work at various military plants in the Russian Federation. And European representative Joseph Borrell is speaking openly about the danger of war in the case of Europe and real danger of North Korean troops in the war against Ukraine. It's not a rhetorical, it's not a theoretical approach. It is because the war is at the borders of Europe and it is because in this war North Korean troops are going to participate. So this, this increases the need for us to work together. To work together guided by common interests and shared values, and with the will to strengthen our efforts to show that democracies deliver best for our citizens. And more about the North Korean involvement and its global implications we will ask Mr. Peter Dickinson, editor of the Ukraine-led blog at the Eurasia Center of Atlantic Council and the publisher of Business Ukraine and Lviv Today magazines. Greetings, Peter. Hello. Hello. So, the question remains. Uh, Vladimir Zelensky has slammed the Western uh, allies of Ukraine for zero reaction, as I quote, to North Korean military involvement in the war against Ukraine. And we are hearing right now that North Korean troops are being deployed to Kursk Oblast and to the front line right now. What do you think about that? Well, I think what we're seeing now is a test for the West. I think Putin is testing the West's reaction to see 
what kind of response they have to the involvement of foreign soldiers in the in the Russian invasion. Uh, so at this stage, we're talking about maybe 10,000 North Korean troops. Uh, but of course, if, if, if Putin feels that there's been no major response, that there's been no major negative consequences for the use of North Korean soldiers, uh, it seems very likely that we'll see a lot more soldiers, that then he'll say, OK, this is a way to solve my uh, manpower problems, Russia's manpower problems. Uh, I will now, instead of using 10,000 North Korean troops, let's talk about maybe 100,000 North Korean troops. Um, this is certainly what I think we should expect to see in the coming months if the West doesn't respond uh, promptly uh, and, and far more forcefully than what we've seen over the last two weeks. So it's a test at the moment. And at the moment, the West is failing that test. What happen if this will be allowed? The deployment of 10,000 and 100,000 K Korean troops to Ukraine. Do you see that a game changer for the war itself? And if it is a game changer, shouldn't be there a back reaction from our allies? It's certainly a game changer. It's certainly going to transform the war. Uh, and it transforms Russian aggression as well. It means that Russian aggression, uh, clearly North Korea has no issue in Ukraine, has no role in this war other than as Russia's ally. North Korea and Ukraine have no uh, no conflicts, no, no, no areas of competition, no areas uh, where they could come into any form of conflict. So this is purely North Korea joining Russia's war in Ukraine. Now, if North Korea is prepared to do that, uh, perhaps it would be prepared to join other Russian uh, military adventures, perhaps the, the conquest of other countries, uh, perhaps military operations in Moldova, in Poland, in the Baltic states against Finland, uh, perhaps in Central Asia. Uh, perhaps in the Caucasus. There are, there are many areas where Russia could use North Korean soldiers. Uh, North Korea has one of the largest standing armies in the whole world. They have more than a million soldiers, uh, which is a far larger number than any other country um, can, can bring to the table. So uh, the, the, the resource base here for Russia to draw on is huge. Uh, it could significantly increase Russia's uh, military strength. Now, of course, Russia's tactics in Ukraine are very, very intensive. Uh, they are, have a high level of losses. They are basically using large numbers of troops to push forward to overwhelm Ukraine's defenses. Uh, a lot of the troops they are using are, are not very well trained. Uh, Russia's most experienced military force, most experienced officers, commanders, uh, and for that matter, troops are, are, are long gone. Uh, they've been already lost in the first two and a half years of the invasion. Uh, so Russia is now very reliant on these, these human wave tactics, uh, throwing men forward to take land and to hold it. Now, North Korean troops uh, should be more or less as effective in that role as Russian troops, uh, untrained Russian troops, Russian conscripts, Russian, mobilized Russians. So the potential for Russia to use these troops elsewhere is significant. Uh, it will give them an edge in Ukraine. It could allow Russia to launch other military operations. And then the other side of this equation is what North Korea is getting from this, which is also crucial for the West. Uh, North Korea is clearly not doing this out of any sense of charity or, or kinship or, 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 or support for Russia. They're doing this because it's very good for North Korea. Um, this allows North Korea to acquire, a, we are led to believe from information that's been released by South Korea, um, that North Korea is receiving quite a lot of money, as you would expect. North Korea is receiving um, material aid in the form of food, food supplies. So those are things that are very useful for North Korea. But crucially, what North Korea is also receiving is military technologies. They're receiving missile technologies, nuclear technologies. Now, these are areas that North Korea has been pushing for a long, long time to try and gain. And if it's gaining those, those, those materials now, those, that, that technology, that technological know-how from Russia, uh, that will be something they will look to use as well. So that will create a whole range of challenges for security in the, in the, in the Asia-Pacific region. So this is how the, 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 there are very global implications for what we're seeing now happening in Ukraine. Well, that's obviously looking for me as a... Beginning of World War III, if uh, you, 
pardon my frankness, because the resources of North Korean army and Russian technologies and equipment will allow really them to launch different operations. Don't you see that NATO as a defensive alliance must act right now, at this moment, preparing for the war, probably a defensive one, but we are what, what we are seeing is deep concerns. Uh, how long is that going to last, those concerns, before the real threat uh, is at the door, or is it still possible for world institutions to rally before it's too late at this moment? Well, it's always possible and it's never too late, I would say, uh, but it's certainly late. Um, what we're seeing now is a major escalation in the war. Um, it's a watershed moment, really, for, for 21st century history, European history. We're seeing, for the first time ever, we're seeing North Korean soldiers waging war in Europe. That's never happened before, and that's now happening. That's now taking place. We have North Korean soldiers on the battlefields of Europe fighting in a war of an invasion, an aggressive imperial invasion, a war of aggression in Europe. Clearly, that is pretty alarming and that's unprecedented stuff. We've never seen that before. Uh, and that's been, that's been possible uh, and is possible today because the West has, a, has adopted a policy of escalation management towards the war in Ukraine, where they've been very reluctant to arm Ukraine, very reluctant to provoke Russia, and have been constantly looking to try and uh, de-escalate and do whatever they can to reduce tensions and to show Russia that they're not ready for a confrontation with Russia. Now, of course, Russia has clearly taken that to be a green light to go further. We now see the next major escalation from Russia is to bring the North Korean army into the invasion. Um, this has to be a, a signal to the West that they need to change policy that NATO leaders need to change policy, that the American leadership needs to change policy, and that the West collectively needs to change policy and adopt far, far tougher uh, policies, far tougher stances towards Russia, which remains the instigator here, which remains the orchestrator of this war, uh, and to show, the, show Putin and to show the Russian leadership that the West will take this far more seriously and will take this step, will not be will not be intimidated by talk of Russian red lines or talk of the need to de-escalate. They need to make that switch urgently because clearly Russia is escalating, Russia is provoked by Western weakness, and now with North Korea entering the war, uh, we have a wide range of new challenges emerging, and what we're seeing now is, is just the beginning. And uh, what about South Korea? We have different rumors that their position to Ukraine aid, a military aid and lethal aid may change in the future. Are they capable of supplying Ukraine with military packages, with military assistance, in spite of their neighbor being North Korea, in direct proximity of even mega cities in uh, South Korea? So they are basically in the range of ballistic missiles and cannon artillery. Should they be concerned more about themselves or can they allow, like, sharing their supplies with Ukraine? Well, South Korea has a very sophisticated and, and, and comprehensive military industrial complex. They have a very well-developed uh, defense industry. Uh, so potentially they could become a major partner for Ukraine. We're already seeing South Korea become a more important player on the inter in the international defense industry. Uh, it's supplying a lot of very important arms to Poland, for example. Uh, a number of contracts have been signed reason recently uh, between, between South Korea and Poland. Um, so the, the South Koreans clearly have the capability to arm Ukraine with very significant weapons. They have the potential to do so. It's really a matter of political will. Um, but the, I think the South Koreans cannot stand idly by and allow North Korea to become a participant to join the war in Ukraine, to join the invasion of Ukraine, and do nothing. Um, the North Koreans, as well as gaining technologies directly from Russia uh, in exchange for their participation in the invasion of Ukraine, the North Koreans will also uh, gain very important experience, vital experience of modern warfare, of drone warfare, of electronic warfare, um, of 
the use of drones on the battlefield, the use of the use of surveillance drones, the use of attack drones, um, these sort of these sort of practical matters that really are, are, are not fully understood by many Western militaries yet. This is where you know the, the development of this form of warfare is taking place at a very dynamic rate here in Ukraine. Uh, and there really is no substitute for practical experience here. If North Korea gains that experience on the battlefield of Ukraine, let's say over the next six months, if North Korean soldiers, North Korean officers and commanders become familiar with the ways in which these, these, the war is being fought, uh, the, the roles being played by drone technologies and uh, electronic warfare, blocking technologies and so forth, um, there is a good chance that they will then look to use that against other opponents, against, against their own enemies. Now, what would that mean? That would mean almost inevitably that North Korea would turn these newly learned skills against the South Koreans, perhaps. Maybe not in a full-scale traditional conventional war, maybe in some form of hybrid attacks. Uh, but it certainly would give North Korea some very significant military advantages over the South Koreans. Now, I think South Korea can allow that to happen. So, at a bare minimum, they need to be in Ukraine as well, gaining similar experience. They need to be in Ukraine helping the Ukrainians defeat the North Koreans, and they need to be in Ukraine arming the Ukrainians to make sure that the Ukrainians do succeed in, their, in, their, in the defense of the country and the defeat of these, these North Korean troops. Let's hope for that, and uh, Taos Korea is an active defense uh, partner of Poland, but you know that uh, the defense cooperation between Ukraine and Poland has been really tense for the last a couple of months, I believe, or even a year. Maybe you have some prognosis, what will happen next? Just your opinion and the finalizing question, what will happen next on the front line? Because we see the role in advance of Russians uh, the Kursk operation is uh, intensifying too, with entire settlements in Russia being uh, ripped off the face of the earth by the Russian army. What do you think will happen next? Well, everything depends on the outcome of the elections in America. Um, this is the crucial issue now. Uh, I think that um, every, you know, everybody, you know, be it, be it the, the, you know, Ukraine's political and military leaders are looking to, to Washington, looking to America. Uh, so is the whole of Europe. So are the Russians. Um, so much now hinges on the outcome of this election. Um, uh, that will be uh, that will be the the. It will shape. It won't necessarily decide the the the, the final outcome of the war in Ukraine of the Russian invasion, uh, but it will define the the future developments that we're going to see. Um, I think certainly, if we look at the specifically at the involvement of North Korea. I think one of the reasons why the West has been so slow to react is because the current uh, American administration, the Biden administration, does not want to sound the alarm at this point and does not want to say, look, look, North Korea is involved in the war. We must take urgent action because this would be effectively a, 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 a confession from them. It would, it would be admitting, it would mean admitting that their policy their policies of, of escalation management have failed. It would be saying it would be it would be them admitting failure and saying yes, for two for almost three years now we've followed these policies and now we see North Korea has entered a European war. So we are we have failed. So they've been very cautious about doing that. Uh, they've been very reluctant to make a lot of noise about North Korea entering the war. Now once the elections are over. They may be more ready to do that, um, but at this point, doing so would be handing uh, their opponent, Donald Trump, a very significant advantage. Because, of course, he would use that to say, look, Biden has failed. I will not fail. You know, now it's time for me to take over the leadership of the country and try and win this uh, win the perhaps not win the war in terms of how Trump would see it, but certainly do a better job of deterring America's and the West's uh, opponents and enemies. Clearly, with North Korean soldiers fighting in Europe, uh, the Biden administration's policies in that, in that sense have failed. Well, that makes a lot of sense for me and I hope for our viewers too. And 
Thank you for being with us, Mr. Dickinson, this evening and regularly. It is very important for us. Thank you. Thank you and have a nice evening. Well, that's all for today. We work for you to be informed and it is your support that matters for us. Be sure to like and subscribe to our UETV channel. Stay tuned for more and goodbye.